Good evening, Byram Hills. I would like to call uh, the meeting to order. It is November 7th, 2023 at 7.17. I'd like to call for a motion to enter into exec session to discuss 2.1 contract matter, 2.2 contract matter, and 2.3 contract matter. So moved. Second. All in favor? See you soon. The board entered into executive session at 717 to discuss three matters, uh, 2.1 contract matter, 2.2 contract matter, and 2.3 contract matter. Can we all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, are there any comments from the public tonight? Hmm. Seeing no comments, um, can I please have a motion to accept the revised agenda to tonight's, the revised agenda with one change, and that would be section 9.2, presentation of architects. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Um, next, can I have a motion to approve 6.1 consent agenda, personnel, 7.1 consent agenda, CSE, sub CSE, CPSE recommendations, and 8.1 consent agenda business? So moved. Second. All in favor? Uh, next, I think we'll, oh, are we did 9.1 first or 9.2? 9.2. 9.2. Okay, great. Welcome. Yes, so um, I want to welcome our architects um, who helped us develop the plan for lights learning action. Recall that this plan is dependent upon use of the capital reserve funds um, in, our vote, in our vote this May. And we are looking to renovate the high school library and lecture hall and hallway and an outdoor space at the library at the high school for our students. Um, that is the learning part of it. The action is a second turf field attached to our current turf field on the, on the practice field. And then last but not least is lights, which will be lights on our turf field and our softball and baseball and tennis courts. Um, and that will occur over a two year period. So we have asked um, our architects, Armand Quadrini, to start Armand, which sounds very much like Armand, we discovered tonight, um, which got you, got you this role. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And appreciate you letting us with a play on words a little bit. Um, so they're gonna take us through some of the renovations of the project and the timelines of the project. It, it's wonderful to be here and to talk a little bit about the learning panels for the Byron Hills High School. Um, I'm joined by Matt and Virgil. They're from Jacobs Construction Management, and I'm a managing partner at KSQ Architects. So between design and construction logistics and budgeting, we really have a lot of the bases covered. Uh, we're anxious to answer any questions you might have and to really prepare uh, for you know, voting activities that will come in the spring. So uh, the agenda for this evening, layout, renderings, and we want to talk a little bit about student safety during construction because this project cannot be completed in one summer. We'll need to do a summer and part of a school year. Um, schedule and then again Q&A and we're happy to entertain questions along the way or where you might go to the end, whatever is your, your pleasure. Um, so just to, uh, at the south end of school, um, the uh, existing library and then capturing the IT department space as well as the tiered instruction space at the top of the plan. Um, so just some of the metrics. Um, the main corridor and to the left is about 11,000 square feet. So that includes your existing library, uh, the existing corridor, and then down to the southern part of the floor plan. Upper right um, is the tiered instruction uh, lecture hall. That's about 2,000 square feet. I might start up at the upper right. Um, the uh, lecture hall is scheduled to be renovated this coming summer. Um, so new finishes, we want to simplify the tiers so that instead of four tiers, there'll be two wider tiers that we can do better instruction and have more flexible use. Um, and then that, when that space is completed, it will be your interim library while we're under construction on the main project across the corridor. All right. Um, one of the most important things that we try to do with these learning commons is to reinvent 
the, the, the high school corridor idea and to deinstitutionalize it. So in yellow, running up and down in, in the floor plan diagram, you can see that the corridor is not just a simple like up and down uh, runway through the, through the high school. It actually steps out and creates an angle. It opens up, um, and, and we're really uh, making an invitation into the new learning commons. And then there's a diagonal line that's the main community gathering space. Um, as you make your way into the library or the learning commons proper, um, Letty's office is right in the center, so uh, observation, the librarian has observation of the overall entire space. You walk through the collection. Um, there are different types of soft seating, hard seating, small and large group instruction. Um, part of the master plan is to improve to the south of the learning commons, the outdoor courtyard. Um, these courtyards invite students outside, um, so it, it's, a, it's a holistic experience in, in the learning commons space. Um, You'll see in the slides in a moment, we're adding a set of doors so we can get direct access from the Learning Commons out um, into the courtyard space. And we're also adding windows. We want to get more natural daylight into the heart of, the, of that part of the high school. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the kind of the workhorse spaces um, that we'll, we'll introduce is, is in the lower part of the plan, the, the multi-purpose large uh, instruction space. It's actually two classrooms of floor area with a demountable wall in the center. Um, it'll be oversubscribed from the day that we open. So it, it's used for education programming, seminars, lectures, <coughs> other visiting school districts will come and, and visit in that space. Um, we're supported by technology throughout uh, all the activities that'll happen in the Learning Commons. Um, on the lower left part of the plan, the special ed unit that's there will remain. Uh, there's some slight modifications that we're going to do, but their floor area will remain and we'll, we'll respect that space. And then, and then in the upper right, I just mentioned there's an existing um, IT demarcation room, and that's where really the, all the, uh, the main uh, IT services come and where they're, uh, where, they're, where they're located, and we'll leave that alone as well. Right. Um, so uh, just one other question for you. So if, if, you have an, if we have an event where students, a student event, parent event, that needs a big space, like is this, it's open enough that you can, how many people do you think can fit in the room? Curiosity. Yeah, so so um, there are a variety of spaces. So the, the overall main space is uh, five or 6,000 square feet. So the, the uh, furniture could be organized in a way that you could have a substantial uh, gathering or opening in, in that space. Um, the two classroom space is about uh, 1,400 or 1,500 square feet. So that, that'll serve uh, 40 or 50 people in one time. Um, I'll just mention that uh, all the furniture's on casters. So um, right now in our library at the high school, we have a lot of tall, shelving units. The only tall shelving units here will be against the wall. Everything else will be low boys on casters. So even the bookshelves, we can move around and reconfigure and reimagine the space. So the sp what's the space right now, square foot advice, do you know? Um, well, without, without the corridor, um, it's about uh, 8,500 square feet. And then when you add the corridor and the other elements, it gets up to 11,000. So um, this is an image. So if you, if you, in your mind's eye, when you enter the library uh, today, you go down sort of a somewhat typical high school corridor, and there are two hollow metal frame doors, and you kind of penetrate through those doors. It's not like a really welcoming invitation to the space, and this is couldn't be more different, right? So we we've got the cor We're still in the corridor in this rendering, uh, making our way into the new learning commons. Um, there's seating out in the corridor, so we put doors at both ends, so the code regards it as a space um, that we, we that, that's uh, fire rated and smoke protected and so on. Um, and now you've got um, proper doors, a, a generous <coughs> opening, and this is that that angle through the plan that I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, we're still tinkering with um, with uh, how we want to, the B and the H and how that's going to work, but we really like this one. Um, it's actually it would be a, a, a custom wood piece that with the red, the flag red. Byram Hills uh, perimeter on it. Um, this is now, uh, we're walking down this angled corridor. This is a, a shot of the circulation desk and the librarian's office is floating right behind it. We introduced the Byram Hills blue in the countertop on, on the circulation desk. Um, and again, this is a sort of a pivotal point that we have visual observation throughout the overall, overall library. So really excited about opening up these new glass windows that I talked about on the end of the spaces on the south edge. Um, the serpentine sofa is the Byram Hills flag red, um, and then the other elements in the back are, are the blue. 
And, and that's uh, me on the couch. That's, <laughs> that's your superintendent. And, and, yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, the superintendent asked me, you know, Armand, is that our bobcat? And I said, yes, that's your bobcat. He said, is, our that our, bobcat. is that our blue? And I said, yes, that's your blue. <laughs> so so, so we're, we're very, uh, very critical to make sure that we're, you know, we're using the, um, you know, sticking with the, the program in terms of uh, the colors and, and, and the criteria. But, um, you know, you can see that uh, these spaces become subscribed. It changes sort of the scent, the feeling of the center or the nexus of the high school. This will be the, a really popular, well-used space. Your, your move to universal lunch, it'll be a really popular place to eat, to socialize. Um, we think about social and emotional needs of our students. I mean, and all those, all those great things are going to happen in this new learning commons. Um, this is the same uh, view, but at a different angle. Um, so we're looking across. And then I, this is the last of the renderings for, for this evening. Um, the, one of the keys to a successful learning commons is having small, medium, and large group instruction. So this is the sort of the smallest one, and it actually has a door to the corridor and a door into the library itself. So you could, you could lock out either one. Um, one, two, three, four students, two students and a faculty member, but this really supports um, all, the, all the typical types of um, activities that could happen in, in, in the learning commons. Uh, re really excited about that. I wanted to also, one of the fun things that we do is um, we have a QR code that um, you, you, know, you can tag this with your smartphone and it'll, it'll let you into, Thank you. sorry Kelly. <laughs> but I, uh, I, I loaded it. Um, I loaded it on my, you know, on my iPad. And so it just lets you see into the space. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing in the spring. Um, we're going to be doing exactly this and inviting members of the community and the Byron Hills Education Foundation after the board um, to go and view the space in the space. Yeah. Just scan it. So I just want to be transparent that um, the renderings are the most current and approved by the superintendent. Some of these colors are we're still updating in, in the Enscape model. So by by uh, by the end of the week we'll have that updated as well. But the link won't change, and you're welcome to link uh, link link to that at any time. Are you going to have charging stations throughout the library? Because I know I know on college campuses now and a lot of other learning commons, the, the kids you bring their own, you know, laptops. Great, great question. Yes, um, we haven't ground through those exact details yet, but sometimes it's embedded in the furniture. Sometimes it's a standalone, you know, station. Um, but we're working, you know, really closely with the director of IT, and we'll we'll make sure those details. Because there's nothing worse than um, you know, having to search for power and then so forth. Remind me, with the summer 2024 date, is, is the plan to be done when the kids get back to school the next fall, or is that the start of this and it's going to take, yeah, so it's going to take time? The start will be the summer and we'll go through of 24, and then by March of 25, we will have the whole learning comments completed. And that's why we'll have a, another room acting as the library in the interim. Exactly. Yeah, just going a little bit out of order. <laughs> so this is a, a, just a quick schedule graphic. Um, so we're in the fall of uh, 23. We are, we are about two weeks away from sending the technical documents up to the State Education Department in Albany. Um, that, that process is running four, four to five months now, so we built that time in, uh, so we're not going to have any surprises. Um, as, as the superintendent mentioned, in uh, May of 24, this will be a, a line item in your budget uh, that will seek approval. Um, we will bid and award the work uh, and during the summer of 24. And then, as I mentioned, summer 24, fall, and then into the winter 24, 25, we'll finish the project and turn it over back over to the high school um, it, right at the, the end of the winter in 25. Um, and again, the critical piece is in, in this coming summer of 24, we want to get that tiered instruction space fit out so it can function as our interim library space. Can I just ask a quick question yes, about the schedule as well? I think somebody touched on this at some point, but just taking a look at the schedule here. Uh, by the way, it looks amazing and it's very yeah. exciting. All the renderings are fantastic. Oh, so I know um, we almost forget to say that. Right? I, I wanted to make sure you know that first because so it really kind. is so exciting. Yeah, okay. It's um, amazing. I'm just thinking towards the construction and how have you scheduled it to make sure to ensure the least possible disruption 
noise wise and you know dust wise and everything else that you have to worry about for the kids. So summer demolition. So so all the the big stuff is going to happen during yeah, the summer. Those. So this is Matt's uh, area of specialization. Mm -hmm. um, not only uh, not only uh, uh, budgeting for the worst, but thinking through the construction logistics. Mm -hmm. um, he's had input into the concept planning to make sure that the materials and systems are available. Um, he's, he's already been identifying long lead items. He was talking about the ceiling. It's hard to get right now. He's like, okay, let's get the bottom. <laughs> get the bottom. <laughs> Finish first. Uh, but but we're, um, we're tracking those those parts and pieces. And we'll, but, but Matt, if yeah, you yes. us through. So part of our process, um, as they're designing, we're going through the schedule. We're going through a study on um, logistics, how we're going to get into the building. Um, this project is happening during the school year. We're going to start demolition in August. Uh, we schedule that out. We're going to provide a schedule in the contract for the contractor and baseline with milestone dates they have to meet. Uh, we believe they can get de uh, demolition done in August. So the, the bulk of the new work is happening during the school year, not the, the noisy, dusty demolition. Um, even so, um, you can see on the plan that we have posted here, um, typically, you know, with construction in the school year, there's contractors in the building while students are in the building. Um, there's the element of safety with fire ratings. You know, it's a requirement that we rate the construction area while school's in session. Uh, we account for this. We are going to give contractors access to the library through the back of the building. Um, luckily, where the library is located, we can get right around that driveway to the back of the high school, easy access through the exterior. We don't have to have contractors check in and mix with the students. Um, the entire construction area in the corridors will be boxed in with fire rated partitions. So they're in their own work area while school happens outside of the work area. Um, typically, we're in constant communication with the director of facilities, so if there is a noisy event or anything like that, um, it's quickly dealt with. Um, this, this next slide just gives you a little detail of the job site access. So again, through the rear of the building, all of our material storage in the rear of the building out of sight, everything is fenced in on the exterior. We don't allow any, not a dumpster, not a piece of material outside to not be fenced in, so there's no risk of students getting to that. Um, and then this just gives you an idea of our work area um, and, and how we're boxing it in. We post Construction caution signage, you know, on all the all the corridor ends where the construction entrances are, everything is locked. Um, and typically, we'll share, you know, as we close to construction, we'll share this schedule and a more detailed plan with the board, so you know how we're going to proceed. Great, thank you. Yeah. If there is a delay for any reason and you have to do demolition during the school year, what what precautions do you take then? Uh, typically, we build into the contract that they. this is the timeline, there's a milestone date they have to finish this task, which is demolition. If they don't, we put in the contract they're responsible for second shift work, so they'll come in after school yep. or weekend work. Great. Uh, and with this type of project, though, we anticipate weekend work consistently and second shift work anyway. Well, one thought, and this might be more for you, Jim, <laughs> during the demolition period, which is mid-August to September, all of our fall sports teams in mid-August are all in the building or at least outside. I'm sure they're in at times. And we thought about just the safety aspect of having... It'll be know, cordoned off at that it point. It will be. Yeah. Okay. We'll hopefully be done before camp starts. Camp starts. Well, mid-August. It's a yeah. demo on there. Mm -hmm. We're open for that, okay. right? The, the work areas, we have to leave a zone of access for the, the fire driveway around the building. So uh, people should be able to get through. We'll have fencing on either side, one for storage and dumpsters and one for access. Got it. They should still be able to go around. Um, I assume you're, when school's in session, you're taking into account the bus schedules and the bus routes and not to interfere yeah. with that. But during the course, during the day, when you're doing the work, where are the workers going to be parking? Typically. And the trucks and yeah. all the other equipment. So I need. we haven't laid out uh, parking yet. Um, we're going to have to do a site walk. What we do is constructability review. Basically, once the drawings go to the state, our team comes to the site, they walk around, and we actually do that find, that finding planning. Um, if we cannot find enough parking for what we anticipate the staffing load to be, then we'll tell them to carpool and we'll, we'll find alternative locations. We've done this should before. be fine with this yeah. lot out here. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And typically they'll park around, they'll park within their fenced in areas, they'll give themselves a little more room, trucks will be stored in there, sometimes overnight, all fenced in. This is because, like, with we, we have athletics in the fall and other Easy other schools Easy coming hot. here, yeah. and there are people in. You know, Fortunately, it's long. the area of the least distraction, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the front of the school, right? It's the front of the school. We can find it's, pretty creative ways. If you're facing the school, you go around the left of the school. It's like there. Mm -hmm. circle. Right. So like, like where where the front entrance, where the front office is. So if you walk out of the front of the building mm -hmm. and make a right and walk all along the building and then. 
make another right to go around the side of the building, mm -hmm. that's where everything's going to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you can see it right there. Yeah. So that, that yellow area, oh, highlighted area, yeah. that's, that's our storage that's fenced mm -hmm. in, right? And then you can see the path of travel with fencing. Right. Uh, that hatched area is basically the path of travel. Yeah, the only concern would be buses and warning. Mm -hmm. but they don't we, we also build into the contract absolutely no movement during busing hours. No Perfect. material deliveries, no okay. leaving or entering. I have to go outside. Yeah. I just mentioned that um, it is a big deal to do con construction during the school year, and we're hyper vigilant about um, all the practices that Matt talked about. Um, we'll be in daily contact with Chris, with the principal uh, at the high school. Uh, we'll order on testing. We're, 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 we really understand how important it is to be as least disruptive as possible. And we're also grateful that we're really off on the south part of campus. I think we have a, we wouldn't have recommended this approach if we weren't confident that you know, we, can, we can make it work. There's also an added um, element of just like coordinating with security. Mm -hmm. from, a, from a supervision standpoint as well, <coughs> Jacobs um, during peak construction will have staff here on site full time. So we're in constant communication with director of facilities, like I explained, and mm -hmm. um, if there's any shifting that has to be done or if there's any incidents with parking, someone's in the way, we're here. So it's usually um, resolved very quickly. Matt uh, was responsible for the library renovation and also the turf field renovation. So we have a lot of confidence. The theater. The theater yeah. I'm sorry, the theater. <laughs> what did I say, the library? The theater. We have a lot of confidence great. in it. That's great. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you so well, much. Any, um, how much parking capacity will be taken up by all the construction trucks? Or not, not, not nothing. Not nothing by yeah. the trucks. Be just on that the side. people working. Okay. There's a lot of potential for storage along the woods line. When we did the front of the high school, the windows, we used that space, and I, we're going to use it again. Got it. Yeah. So there's some precedence. So you're yep. familiar with the location. That's great. Yeah, yeah we've done work here several times. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so and much. And the is really excited. Yes, I, I mean, the students are over the most. Excited. I'm the most excited. <laughs> Would you believe the students were super excited about the library? They lit up for the library. It's the yeah. new heartbeat of the school. It's yeah. 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 That's great. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks for coming out. Today. So generous. Thank, yes. you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Unless you want to stay Thank you. Take care. Good to see you. That's why you do a video. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do you want dark chocolate or milk chocolate? We, we went through all the flavors. We've got all the flavors. Dark this chocolate one, with all the is dark. Which one was dark? Oh, the red. Oh, the red. That one is dark. Hold on. Just gave that one to. Oh, I got this one. Oh, right. We ready? I'm sitting in the cat. Dr. Okay. We're going to move on to. Nine, no, oh, Kelsey, nine. Back to 9.1. Like, so, yeah, Back to 9.1 special report, budget versus actual <laughs> expenditures analysis. Kelly, take it away. Thank you. So, so I did this the first time last year, so I, I did a similar format as I did last year. Uh, part of the board's goal last year was, was this uh, report. So I'm going to just continue it every year, keeping the same format so you can compare it year to year when you have you know, a lot of free time or you're very kids sleep. Um, so in terms of just the budget categories, our budget last year, $96.9 million. The um, finance advisory is pretty familiar with these categories. When I talk about the projected budget for next year, I, I, I lay them out in these categories. And then just, you know, salary is every salary for every person in the district. Benefits are the same. So our top uh, five categories, uh, salary and benefits, obviously the top two. Um, in any school district, operation and maintenance, again, not salary related, anything that we're doing in the, in the facility to maintain it, special ed and then debt service as well. So in terms of percentages, 53% uh, in salaries based on collective bargaining agreements or employment contracts, 25% uh, for our benefits, you know, health insurance, our vision, our social security unemployment. Uh, a little less than 4% for operation and maintenance, again, not salary related, just, just maintaining our buildings, our utilities, our, our uh, natural gas, electric. Um, and then a little less than 4% for special ed uh, for our, uh, you know, our students' uh, intuitions, our speech, and our itinerant services. Uh, a little, little, little higher than 3% for technology, so any computer repair, support, our, our systems, our software, our hardware, um, and equipment. Less than 3% um, for debt service. Um, again, we have a couple years left on our debt service. That's 3% of our budget. Uh, Greater than 1%, a little over 1% for transportation, other and transfers. Other is pretty much a, a large category. It has insurance, has legal fees, auditing, 
consultants, everything uh, that we need to maintain. Um, and then a little less than 1% for athletic security uh, curriculum uh, BOCES in our building budgets. Here's a breakdown in terms of percentages of the budgets, uh, per categories. Um, as you can see, uh, from 53% for salary down to 0.4% for athletics. Okay. So just a little bit about how the budget process works and how we close out a year on a year to year basis. Um, you start out the year towards the end of, of, of last year. Uh, you, you place an order in June or you, you have uh, things going on and not paid for yet. They get carried over into the 22-23 the school year. So there are 21-22 purchase orders and transfers get carried over into last year's budget. Okay. And then as the budget continues and you, you, know, you start spending, you make additional transfers uh, throughout the year to cover expenses. And then at the end of this year, the last year, 22-23, again, the same thing. Orders placed in June, orders that haven't been paid yet get carried over into the 2023-24 budget. So that difference in purchase orders from 21-22 to 22-23 is about $2 million. Now, last year, it was, it was a little less, but this year, it's about $2 million. So I, I say that because that, that explains why there's a difference in terms of this category here for adjustments, transfers, and encumbrance on a year-to-year -year basis. It wasn't your budgeting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Just <laughs> to make it clear. <laughs> oh. uh, so here, here's, a, here's a list of, or by category, um, uh, simplified categories uh, for our budget uh, last year of $96.9 million. The transfers and the encumbrances, again, as I just explained on a year-to-year basis, are actual expenditures in that year. Now, when you look at it, you'll say well, you overspent your budget, um, but you, again, it's, it's not the case. You're bringing money from the prior year into the new year, so it's, you're, not, you're not spending more than your budget did. It's just, it's more, uh, the expenses occur in that year. Okay. So here's a look historically of where we've been budget expenditures. Again, it looks kind of strange here when you look at last year because it crosses that line, which you usually don't want to do. You <laughs> budget. Um, but this is a good thing to look back in prior years where we've, we've been, you know, we had a higher budget and our expenditures were a little lower, so we had a little more surplus. Um, this, these last couple of years, we've been a little, little leaner on that budget process, which uh, we spoke about in the finance advisory. And, and for the next couple of years, we'll still be in the same position uh, until our debt uh, retires. So here's a look at our revenue side. So we just talked about expenditure. Let's talk about how we pay for it, the revenue side. Um, here's the categories for budget for revenue, uh, tax levy, state aid, pilots, etc. cetera. Uh, the, the first category tax levy, we did receive $155,000 more than we budgeted. This is due to the fact that we have split properties. Um, so those properties pay uh, to bar, towards buyer mills. It's not on the town of North Castle Roll or, or Bedford or whatever. It's on other rolls, but they're split within uh, borderline properties where it's Chappaqua, Byron Mills, the kids come to our uh, district, so we receive that tax revenue, even though they're not on the roll for the, the, the town of North Castle. And you never budget for that because you just don't know what they're going to choose. Potentially that, that, that home could sell and that, that individual could decide to go to Chapel, right. not Byron Mills. So right. we don't budget for that because it's not 100%. Although we could because it always happens. Yes. That they come yeah. to it's true. Yeah. We could, but we don't. Give away all the secrets. Um, <laughs> State aid, uh, we had an increase of 383,000. Uh, we had a change in the transportation aid ratio, so we received a little more transportation aid than we anticipated in the budget process. And then again, that uh, additional revenue based on BOCES expenditures. So BOCES aid is based on what you spent in the prior year. Okay, so we, we spent a little more than we, we anticipated or, or what the governor said we were gonna receive. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, the pilot the ratio, did the ratio stay the same? It's just we spent a little bit more, so we got some back, more back. Yes. Yeah. And the transportation ratio increased uh, for us last year. Yeah. We get more reimbursement for transportation. It's based on increased enrollment and then assessed values. There's a whole formula on it. I state. see. So, but we'll have a better number this year because we know about it okay. uh, going forward. Uh, pilots, uh, uh, an increase of $21,000. We The IBM pilot uh, expired, and we didn't have a set number. The agreement was still being um, agreed upon. So we did uh, we did estimate a lower number uh, for that pilot. Uh, and it turned out it wasn't as much of a decrease as we thought it would be, so we got a little more, $21,000 more than we had, had budgeted. The huge number in terms of uh, difference in revenue is, is in other, other revenue, and that's solely based on uh, county sales tax uh, and interest earnings. Uh, we had uh, about $1.4 million uh, additional in interest earnings, so a large increase in that. And that's what that $2.3 uh, million increase is. That's the happy problem. Yes. So you see our revenue total is $96.6 million, but we did spend 97.4. Okay, so 
we don't need to use fund balance. We, are, we budgeted to use $922,000, that's not required. But we do need money to balance the budget of $818,532 to get to that expenditure and balance out zero, zero. 97.4 to 97.4. So, said another way, if we didn't have the interest income, we would have had to draw down another one and a half million bucks of reserves. In yeah. Order to balance Essentially, it. yeah. That but doesn't mean that we overspent. The, but we didn't use the interest income. Well, it's part of our revenue total. Right. We didn't use gotcha. yeah, yeah. Right. So, again, revenue and expenditures. Uh, again, we've been guiding that line for the last uh, two, three years. We're a little over again. It's different. Our expenditures were more because we carried over the purchase orders, remember? So that, that's, the graph looks a little strange yeah. that way. I mean, if you adjusted it, so you're really looking at like budget to actual putting aside the fact that there was a timing issue around some of the purchase yeah. orders, then the line wouldn't look the way the line no, was, right? No, it'd be a surplus, yeah. Is but it would be a slight time? surplus compared to what it has been like three, four, or five years ago. 100%. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, yes, 100%. Yeah. And this, is this also because we're make, we're creating very lean budgets? So Absolutely, yeah. see that. Mm -hmm. So there's really no waste in our budget? Correct, so yes. That. So that's a couple, three years. Just to sure I'm looking right. mm -hmm. um, so again, this was from last year. Um, so there's there's a couple things you need to do. You need to balance your budget. Um, you you don't need to, but it's recommended to keep that four percent fund balance. Okay, we we've, we've done that here uh, for this, a long time, and it's recommended to keep that four percent fund balance. So you need funds to do those first two categories. Uh, fund Eblar, we didn't have to do that this year because we had uh, we paid some some people out this year. Some people retired and they received payments, so we we didn't need to add additional funds to that reserve. Um, tax tertiary reserves, we didn't need to fund that. Either we had some settlements, some of our, our larger tax surgery or cases that were pending have been settled, um, and with the district not having to pay anything uh, back to those companies. So, Correct. a great thing. And then, optionally, an optional on a year to year basis, you can fund the TRS reserve. So, we didn't, again, tax search, we didn't need to do that uh, because we had the reduction. EBLR, people retired, we didn't need to add additional funds to the EBLR. Um, and then, TRS reserve, we didn't, we didn't do that. Again, that's an optional uh, thing. So. To balance the budget, we need $707,000. Uh, to maintain that 4% fund balance, we need $111,000. Okay, and that's at $818,000 total that we needed from reserves uh, in order to balance the budget. So where'd the money come from? The, the reduction in tax search area reserve, because again, we had, we had some cases that closed and we didn't have to pay it, so we didn't need to keep that money in reserve. Um, and then some funds we took out of the uh, retirement uh, ERS reserve. In order to balance the budget, and to maintain that 4% fund balance. So here's the balance uh, as of July 1st, 2022, the beginning of last year, we had uh, $20.7 million. During the school year, or at the end of this year, we earned, again, a significant amount of interest, uh, $1.4 million. Um, that money was transferred, all that interest earned was transferred into the capital reserve, that uh, 1.3, oops, that 1.3. Property loss, you're not allowed to, to, to take the trans to take the uh, interest earned, you have to keep it in the, in that reserve specific to that reserve. If we want to do that in the future, uh, we'd have to have a, a public hearing and have a discussion. Um, I didn't feel it was it was necessary to, to pull that at that point. Um, so again, all that interest got transferred into the capital reserve. Um, again, the decrease in, in tax surcharge reserve ERS that payout that I said about Eblar where we paid people out. Uh, based on their uh, their contractual agreements for their sick and vacation days, and then uh, the additional surplus of eight hundred twenty eight thousand dollars gets us to uh, that balanced budget. That eight that difference. I know you, you saw eight eighteen. You're thinking of this is eight eighteen, but the difference is uh, the interest earned on the reserves. Okay, the eight twenty eight. If you sit, if you subtract the what we needed in reserve plus what we got in interest, that difference is eight oh oh five oh seven nine. Okay. And our capital reserve right now is a $7.4 million. Um, we talked about, oh, we have a uh, capital project vote coming up in May, as we just talked about, for $8 million. Um, we talked about this year using additional interest earned that we're going to earn in these reserves to get to that $8 million. So um, at the end of October, interest earned on, on our reserve accounts was about $430,000. So we have about $145,000 to go in interest earnings. Um, and I anticipate doing that transfer um, you know, before December. Yeah, before December. I, I thought it'd be a little later, but fortunately, the interest rates are, are still uh, very good. Um, so you may see me come back to you at the end of December to make that transfer to get us to the eight million dollars before the the vote, the capital vote, uh, in May, to get us there. 
Um, just coming up for budget, present budget, uh, you know, it's coming up very quickly. Um, some concerns, considerations, I say concerns, uh, the retirement uh, rates for the next two year, next year uh, for TRS and ERS, uh, Swiss chip rates. I'm hearing uh, it could be a, a large increase, potentially, hopefully, Jen would probably know better, hopefully not, um, for Swiss chip. Uh, it's certainly not going to be as small as it's been. Yes, that's what I've heard. Okay. Um, and then uh, utilities, you know, utility increases uh, in, in the future. Uh, we did, uh, through EPEX, uh, purchase uh, or do through a cooperative, get some, get some you know, savings for our electric because we grouped together as a whole to buy a section of electric. And that probably saved us about $60,000 last year um, in electric costs. So we're going to continue to do that next year and hope to get some, some better rates going forward. Uh, but those are the some budget considerations that we should be thinking about going forward uh, as we start the budget process this year. That's it. Any questions? I didn't go too fast. And I guess the one thing that just strikes me that we just have to be mindful of is because the reserves, if the if the projects are approved, mm -hmm. so then we're at the roughly thirteen million dollar level, right? Then we have to be careful year to year about drawing on those reserves for operating mm -hmm. funds. Definitely. Because if we do hit a recession, we just want to make sure we have ample reserves to really use them to make sure that we can sustain all of our programming, our staff, right. and everything else that we'd want to do during a downturn. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing to me. Just going into next year, just be mindful of. Yeah. I think when we go forward, maybe look at reserves, and especially entire retirement reserves, whereas if there's a large increase, we take a portion of that increase and apply it to the reserve. You know, if a million dollar increase, maybe we take, no, that's too big, $200,000 increase, maybe we take 100000 from the reserve and apply that. Um, just to buy, kind of buy that down a little bit if there's a large increase in those, in those areas. I mean, maybe we just manage them a little differently than we have in the past, mm -hmm. not wait till the end, do it as the expenses come up. So something to think about, something I'll be discussing with finance advisory uh, coming up soon. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. All right, let's move on to unfinished business, and that would be item 10.1, assessment report part two, results of New York State testing program. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Sorry. They're on embargo final? Unbargo final. <laughs> I'm sorry for my assessment report. Oh, it's like six months later. <laughs> I know. So, um, Great introduction, uh, Lori, thank you. So I'm able to present this today, and I'm going to start with that. So I can present, that. that's why it's called part two. I was here in September, ready to present, but I wasn't allowed to speak about the results. And so I'm finished. <laughs> what would have happened if you did? Um, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely not. nothing. It's a good idea. There was a year I didn't do it before. <laughs> I won't tell you what year, and nothing happened to me. I'm still here. Um, I did present some other data. Session limitations, rather. <laughs> yeah, you know, if, you know, if I don't show up at the next meeting, <laughs> we'll have to beam you in from New Jersey. Right. Right. Stay at prison, I'll be in handcuffs. Um, I did present in September. We had an international benchmarking data that I presented, and I also presented data from our uh, diagnostic uh, assessment that we did three mm -hmm. times a year. So I presented that data. So here's part two. While it, the embargoes released, the state did not release all of the results statewide yet. So I don't have access to New York State or regional data. So I can't do that comparison. So I'll have a part three that I'll do. Who knows when? <laughs> um, they say early December. So I'm ready Are to go with it. Exams again right after? Uh, yeah, right <laughs> after. So we'll still be analyzing state results yeah. in probably January. Simply unbelievable. It's, it's upsetting it's because sad. we want to utilize information to improve. And yeah. Yeah. Instruction. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So I'll present what I can present today. We'll go through some of that. Um, I have a few slides on the background. I won't go through the whole story of the background of the state testing system, but I like to keep this all here just as a record of all the changes. Um, I do want to point out that there was no fourth grade science test this year. That cohort will be tested this year in fifth grade because so they moved the science test at the elementary level from fourth to fifth. So those students in fifth grade didn't test last year because they're going to test this year. Um, there's some information about the test not being able to be compared. I'll move on to that. Let's just get into the data. We just remind our community that there are four performance levels on the three through eight tests. We're looking for having students be at levels three or level four, um, which is proficiency or exceeding grade levels at level uh, four. 
So this is uh, the results of our data. We have our ELA data from third through eighth grade. The green arrow is highlighting the percent of students who reach proficiency, which is levels three and four. Um, doesn't mean a lot out of context. So I do have this next slide, which will give you a year to year comparison. So we can look at last year compared to this year. So we're looking at ELA first. You see the, again the proficiency rating here and then the change from last year. You'll see two big numbers that are highlights. Fifth grade going up 15 percentage points. That means 15% more students reach proficiency than the previous year. In eighth grade ELA, it was 11%. Um, I'll, when I look at, I'll look at several years in a row, we'll look at some trends and I'll hypothesize about why that might be happening. Um, I want to remind our community as well that the three through eight tests are designed to be um, opportunities for us to find students that are not reaching the standards and then provide interventions and support to get them the standards by the time they reach high school. So the fact that we don't have 100% by third grade is okay. Um, we just want to see an increase over time in this data so that when students get to the high school, which is considered a high stakes test, you need to pass the English Regents, graduate, uh, and want to have our students at or above proficiency. So that's the purpose of the three through eight tests. Ultimately, it's our kids progressing at the rate we want them to, and if not, providing some back for some bench, uh, providing some interventions and giving them the support. We have such a significant jump in some of these numbers, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. Then um, you still have sort of the same amount of support resources in the schools. Mm -hmm. Does it turn out that fewer kids need it and then they're allocated to other places, whether it's enrichment or other places, or is it you still finding that the same number of students need that support yeah. because it's not only the test, it's also what's happening in the classroom? Sure, so we'll look at more than just the state test. There is the mandated intervention that we have to provide. So the state makes us provide intervention to students who are below level three, right. we have to. Um, we use some other data so we can compare. So maybe a student last year was reached, let's say in fourth grade they were receiving services, in fifth grade, they're proficient. But we have other data from our iReady data, our diagnostics, some in-class assessments, that still says maybe there's some weak areas. So we want to still provide support for that student in fifth grade. We don't want to just say, oh, suddenly you're a point into level three, we're going to forget about you. So we look at the low level threes and maybe look at historically the past few years to see where they were, to see if we still want to provide some services. Maybe they're not as intensive. So we look at the degree of intervention. So students could have anywhere from one day a week to five days a week of intervention, depending on what their needs are. And so, do you think at this point the iReady versus the mm -hmm. state tests, like which one's obviously a lot quick, quick, quicker, it's yes. I mean, not even a contest, but right. putting the speed aside, reliability, yeah. Yeah, accuracy, so what do you think? I would say that the um, iReady data is um, more specific. So, because it breaks down the ELA or the math test into subcategories, so we can immediately see areas. For example, in literacy, you're looking at uh, phonological awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. So it gives you all that breakdown so we can differentiate a little bit. Some of those areas aren't um, measured on the state test. Also, I would say that it's um, probably Harder is not the right word, but more discriminating um, on the iReady data. You know, so uh, does it, cor it correlates loosely to the state test. I was looking at that analysis as well, and it's in the ballpark. State test, I would say we perform better on the state test than the iReady. Because the iReady is adaptive, so it's trying to find where that student is, where the ELA doesn't, isn't adaptive. Um, let's look at the math results from last year, and you see several areas where there's a big increase from last year. Um, four, third and fourth grade, jumping 10 and 12 percentage points from the previous year, um, and seventh and eighth grade again. And that eighth grade is unbelievable. So I, I don't know exactly, I'll, I'll give you some hypothesis on my next few slides when I look at trends over several years. What I do see here that I'm liking is consistency, a little more consistency here. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I said before, you want to see improvement from third through eighth, but we're getting a little more accuracy from year to year to year, which is maybe there's a little stability in the assessments or in our student performance. Um, so this was, again, some interestingly unusual results, um, which lets us dig a little deeper into some of our other data to see if that is a pattern. 
There's also the question is, was this test scale different? And that I won't know until that next set of data is released and I can look at statewide and regional trends. Then I can see, did everybody go up or did we go against the, the culture? Mm -hmm. So that's something I'll be able to compare when I get the rest of the data sometime in December. Mm -hmm. I heard that. Yeah. So um, I just want to remind you that I'm, I'm going to look at some uh, trends over the last four years, but we're eliminating 2020. The tests were canceled because of the pandemic. In 2021, the state shortened the test and it's not comparable to previous years. So it was really, uh, they didn't want to give the test, but the federal government made them. So they gave these tests. There were released items on it. It just wasn't anything to use. So I'm going to show you some trend data. We're only looking at 2018, 19, 22, and 23. So ELA, here we go with grade levels, three through eight, looking at these four years. Um, so those numbers in the bubble show from 2018 to 2023. So in third grade, we had 73% proficient. Whoops. In um, 2018, 79% per, per, proficient in 2023. So that's an increase of six percentage points. So you do see the last two years here, maybe a little stability. What I like to see is three to five years would tell me that we've sort of steadied out and that's where we're performing. So um, a bit of an upward tick in the last couple years here. This is post-pandemic. So I'm happy to see that our students are doing better than they were pre-pandemic. Remember, we were in school full-time at the elementary level during that pandemic year. And we've put a lot of resources into helping our students post-pandemic and we're very sensitive to that. Um, so that's one of my hypotheses is that we've been really attentive to providing that support for students during the post-pandemic. Fourth grade, you're seeing some stability here in the last three years of mid to high 70% proficiency. Fifth grade is an, uh, an unusual story. I'm not sure exactly why we're having the spike this year, but we were hovering around the mid 60s, which was um, low. And we had talked about that in previous years compared to third and fourth. But now we're back up to where third and fourth are, a little stability there. So is this just happen? It could be that this cohort just happens to be stronger. It could be that it's just an anomaly and next year we might be back down. I don't know. Or we might be starting to make some changes in our curriculum, which we have been, that are starting to drive things up. So remember, we started our literacy study last year. We've been engaging our faculty in some research-based practices around literacy. I'm hoping that that's going to have an impact. It seems soon to me. It's a little early, but maybe there's some early things happening. When were these tests administered again? Uh, May, uh, May of 2023. May of 2023. <laughs> the end of last year. You see sixth grade's been fairly stable with that one peak there. Seventh grade fairly stable, one dip here in 2019. And then eighth grade, we had this big jump again. It was fairly stable for the last few years at the mid 80s and now jumped up to the mid 90s somehow. <laughs> so these are things that I can't quite explain yet, but we're digging through that and we'll see what next year brings. This data from the end of this year to see if you're starting to see some stability there. Let's look at the same cohort. So these, again, ELA, but I'm looking at the same group of students this time. The last graph show just this the same grade level, but different students. This is, these are the same students. So what we'd want to see with the same cohort is they go from grade to grade is an increase. And you see that in all cases. Wow. And some big jumps. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, that's the point job. of the three through eight test. We hope to minimize the students needing support because we've done interventions and now they have the foundation. So this is an interesting graph as well. So I looked at our disaggregated by our students with disability. It's a cohort we like to look at. Um, we have been on an upward trend, and this year, following the patterns of the ELA scores, our students with disabilities are achieving at higher proficiency levels. That's three through five, and then I look at the six through eight, which is another job. Do you think this is because we had our students in school during COVID? I think that's one hypothesis. I think that's part of it. I think there's multiple factors because the jumps are pretty significant. That could be one factor of it. Um, we have been looking, particularly at the middle school, over the last three years. Kim Lappel has been working with her team on um, refining our MTSS plan, which is the mm -hmm. intervention plan. And so she's really proud of what the work that they've done. And we're, we have that MTSS design team right now. 
they feel really good about their system. It's, it's special tiered systems of support. Great. Right. Yeah. So what that does is we look at assessment data, state tests, but other data, students who are falling below grade level skills, we do interventions, which means we provide them services multiple times a week so that we can build up the skills. And that might be having an impact. I think another thing affecting our students with disability could be that we did the training last year with every special education teacher in orton Gillingham methods. And the teachers all immediately started putting that into practice last year. We trained them in the fall of last year. And all of those practices have been, been put into place, and we've been working with the teachers on developing a coherent scope and sequence. It seems early that it would have that big of an impact, but again, there could be multiple layers of, um, of our items that have been um, impacting the students' performance. And I guess it could be the, the IRA data and the use of that to troubleshoot on areas of improvement. Yes. Yeah. And our, our teachers have been using that data now. We're, we, we have used that since uh, 2020, so we've been, we're in our fourth year this year. And then I guess if the state, if the cut scores were different, that also could impact it. That could. And we won't know how we go with, you know, for right. going with the trend or against the, the statewide trend. Well, that's quite a jump from 2018. It is, yeah. Such good news. Yeah. Here's one more piece of data. So I am able to get through a warehouse. I can look at some of our local... Um, districts. These are some peer, competitive peer districts, and I chose three just to look at to try to give me some insight into that story. How are we doing trend-wise? Um, so you see District 1, 2, 3 over here compared to us. So this is ELA 3 through 5. Typically, we would have been a little bit lower here, so we are catching up in that range of these competitive peer districts um, in ELA uh, three through five and six through eight were a little bit above them. So that's telling me that maybe we are going against what the normal trend would be if we're catching up with these peer districts. Um, I'll do the same in math. So again, we see trends here. Uh, third grade was going down a bit, but back up to 90. Fourth grade has some up and down. So this could just be an up. Um, again, we'll see what I'm hoping to see is some very similar graphs for multiple years to see that we have some continuity. And then going up in fifth grade here in math. Math is all in the ballpark, hovering plus or minus the 90 there. This could be, there's been a lot of work on our interventions and our um, supports for students who are below proficiency in math. We were experimenting with finding some new interventions and we're formally piloting two intervention programs at Coleman Hill and Wampus. So this could be, again, part in part an impact of that intervention. In the middle school, sixth grade is fairly consistent, a little higher this year. Seventh grade had a big jump, and eighth grade had a huge jump for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, again, it could be part of that support in our middle schools to provide that, those services for students. Again, looking at cohort, increase at all levels when I look at cohort data over those four years. <clears throat> Looking again at math, students with disabilities, again, 2023, seeing a jump in math. So more students are achieving at higher rates with the students with disabilities. Another factor, I've had a conversation with our director of special services, Ms. Boynton, and we've been able to have more of our students with disabilities in the general ed classrooms. We have over 70% of our students in a general education classroom for 80% of the time or more. And that's a large amount of time in a gen ed. That could be lifting them up as well. So I don't think there's one magic bullet here. I think it could be a combination of things that is having this type of impact. And then six through eight, you see this huge jump here. Again, could be multiple reasons. It could be a combination of all these things that we've been putting into place. Double from 2018. That's really yeah. amazing data. That's great news. Whatever they're doing, keep doing yeah. it. Exactly. <laughs> right. And here's comparing the peer districts um, in math. Three through five is up right in the same place as these districts, um, and then exceeding them in the middle school. It's interesting, the middle school, which are tough you know, socially and academically, that they're excelling. That's incredible. And I think it's a much more important number because as long as you get to the place at the end that you need to be, it doesn't yeah, really matter. Exactly. That's what I agree on. I mean, you want kids there because you want them to feel good about their performance, as long as we're dealing with all the other aspects. But you still want kids to be reading and exceeding at high levels and feeling good about their academic But they must be getting the tools to learn. So yes. They must be getting the, the base to, to 
to build upon if they're excelling. Absolutely. And I think I would also want to really commend our faculty for working really hard during the pandemic and really taking seriously that post-pandemic loss that kids might have been experiencing. And let's just say our parent community who really has supported the kids as well. I think all those factors have an impact on students. Um, four through eight, our eighth grade results last year um, were right in line with previous years, except last year was a bit of a dip. That test will be new this year. Fourth and eighth grade science tests will be completely new. So we'll start over on logging that information. Um, I'll go through some Regents exams, although I was able to give you Regents data in July, we did look at this, but let me just summarize it. As the state revises the assessments, we have new assessments. They do five performance levels on the Regents exam, so some of the newer exams have five levels. Um, our English Regents, I showed you this data previously comparing it to elementary, but this is an extremely high rate um, of having level five, which is exceeding the grade level expectations. We have 89 percent of our students performing at that level, which is really incredible. Again, I don't have the statewide comparison yet for this year, but last year we were ranked number one in New York State for students scoring about proficiency, That's which amazing. is pretty amazing. Incredible. That speaks a lot to our, our literacy program. In Algebra one Regents, these are all students, and I separated out between eighth and ninth. We would expect our eighth grade students to perform better. Those are our a high, there are high performing students um, in eighth grade that get accelerated, but we're still at a fairly high rate here <clears throat> in um, level five, which is up 11 points from the previous year, 2022. This, this is the graph. So the red bar shows the, the level uh, five, which is that exceeding expectations. Um, this 2014 was the first administration of the Algebra One Regents. So as the test went on, we got a little better at pushing students up higher. We had a bit of a dip in 2019, but then we're getting back to where we were, about the high 70s. But always having almost all of our students reaching proficiency in Algebra 1. Our Earth Science, Living Environment, and Chemistry, these are still the old regions. They have been revised. They're phasing in the new science test starting this year or next year. So these have been really consistent over time. I don't even bother looking at those. I do like to point out every year, though, you see less students at the mastery level in chemistry. That is because we have most of our students take regents level chemistry. Some schools have a non-regents class. We don't. We have just regents chemistry. So we expect any student who wants to take chemistry and all of our students, most of our students do, um, we have them in a regents class. So you see a little bit more of a spread there. And it is one of the harder regents exams. And it, it really is. Yeah, it's hard, hard exams. exams. But that's but if you compare our numbers to other schools, you think most other schools have two of uh, have two of those. A lot of schools do. Yeah. So they have a non region so you're just testing some of the kids. So they're so we're a little bit lower. You'll see here, um, I have rankings from twenty twenty two. Uh, we were ranked number one in Westchester in living environment, four in our science chemistry is a little lower. And that's because I think we're having more of our kids take it. And it's a stretch, but it's a good experience for them. Yeah. So we believe in doing that. Global history, it's in the third year of the new test. Um, these results got a little bit better as the test uh, comes out and we get to know it and we know how to instruct a little differently. More students performing at level five. And this was the first year last year of the U.S. History and Government exam, the new exam. And the results are fairly in the ballpark of where we have been previously. Is that the same thing? Are all kids taking? Um, so yeah, we have, there there's 164, AP so it's most. AP U.S. is taking it. Yeah, there's AP U.S., so there's some there. So you see the number 164, the N is a little bit lower than... It's, I'm not sure what this class was last year. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's almost everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come back for my staff report and go a little more in details on the uh, literacy goals, so I won't touch that. In math, just some of uh, our priorities this year, we're looking at differentiated tasks. We are working in the classroom to differentiate the math games in K through 5. We're piloting the two intervention programs in math. We have our advanced learner program, K-5, we're implementing this year. And we're evaluating our accelerated math pathways. And Lisa Pellegrino will join us later in the spring for a curriculum conversation in mathematics. We're piloting a science program. We'll be evaluating our 6 through 12 science curriculum um, and having a tri-state visit next year. And social studies and world language are similar goals to previous years around historical thinking and proficiency. That's our new mural over Pompas part of that. So, 
Amazing. Oh. Amazing. So that's the Tim, assessment report. If, if Ira <laughs> oh, <laughs> still sat that? on the board, <laughs> Ira would say, Tim, we appreciate the work that you do <laughs> so much. There is not another you, person <laughs> anywhere in any other district who knows as much as you do about our students, our curriculum, and look where you have helped to take them. So. Thank you so much. You have relationships with teachers. You know our kids. You know our curriculum. You know benchmarks and where we're supposed to be. This is a phenomenal report. Roll well, up our sleeves and do the hard work. So yeah. I want yeah. every student to be succeeding. Very right. impressive. Right. Really Thank you. Very impressive and detailed. Thank and you so I'll much. I'll come back again when I'm allowed to. Yes. <laughs> a little bit more to do another update. I won't <laughs> take your sale. I won't take the window. The intro. You took his oh, intro. Oh, Tim, that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Okay, let's move on to item 10.2, review of some first read policies, 5100, 4850, and 4322. All right, that's well, all Gina. All Gina. <laughs> okay. Well, the team. Right. Our, <laughs> our policy committee. So um, we're bringing back policy uh, 5100, which is the comprehensive attendance policy. Um, this, again, outlines our strategies that we employ uh, to maximize our student attendance and also our responsibilities when attendance or tardies or early dismissals are escalating, and it, it guides us in terms of our interventions to help support students. Um, in 2020, you may recall that there was an addendum that was uh, became a part of this policy because our master schedules, both at the high school and the middle school, had been revised. And as a result, the percentages of either absences, charities, et cetera, had to be um, adjusted as well. We did do that, um, but what we did not do at the time was uh, go back into the policy and ensure that the actual number of absences um, were, were brought up to speed in terms of the um, ratio between the number that were allowed and then um, the time in class and so forth. Um, as well as what would be justified as a tardy in terms of making sure that the number of minutes was in line with the schedule. So um, nothing in terms of the content necessarily has changed um, in the policy, but we just have updated our numbers um, and so that they align correctly with the percentages. Any questions? Okay. Um, we'll move on to 4850, switching gears here to animals in the schools, um, <laughs> which, which is quite outdated. Our policy was outdated. Um, it used to be called the study of anatomic specimens, but as you might imagine, um, this, is, this again just guides us in terms of what our responsibilities are for ensuring that the, when we do study living things in school that we are, are doing so um, with respect and care for life. That was uh, something that was added this time in terms of our proper care and handling of these uh, particular animals um, as it relates to the curriculum and things that have stayed uh, consistent is that of course we are notifying our students and our parents when any kind of dissection uh, is occurring and of course have parents have the right to opt out their child for religious or moral purposes um, that has continued. Um, so again, just a, a couple of updates, but really honing in on uh, the care of uh, these specimens or these animals in our schools, and not to be confused with our other policy, which is 1515, um, which allows for uh, service animals to be in our school. So different than our dogs. <laughs> yeah. um, any questions on that one? All right. And last, um, just Tim had just mentioned this program, but last is our policy number 4322, and that is our programs for advanced learners, which again was um, pretty outdated. We wanted to bring it back to um, be updated and improved by all of you, as we do have our program K-5, as Tim mentioned, for advanced learners. And again, this just outlines, uh, outlines and ensures that our students who are both um, uh, advanced, um, have opportunities, sorry, opportunities um, to reach their maximum um, aptitude and achievement by providing resources and ensuring that our staff that are working with these students are trained, that we have a um, the ability to have a status update um, per the superintendent for all of you and our public. Uh, such criteria would look at how we are measuring the program, how our students are doing in the program, any additions that we need to make in terms of professional development for those who are providing the instruction, and then overall how we're evaluating the program.
I'll just remind our community that we do have information on our district website about the advanced <coughs> learner program. It's under the curriculum tab, so our community can read about our program, and I shared that at the previous board meeting. Great. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, guys. And Lara, Jason, and Melissa, thank you. I believe we have a motion to accept for first read uh, policies 5100, 4850, and 4322. So moved. Second. All in favor? Great. Uh, looks like there is no new business. So we move on to staff reports. All right. Turn it over to you, Jen. And excuse my distraction, our girls' volleyball team oh, is playing and so they. The Wallkill won the first match, Byram won the second and the third, and in the fourth match, so far, it's 23-17 Byram. Ah, two more. So, yeah, and this is so, the regional semifinals. This is big, right? This is the... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is the... Class A state regionals, but this is one of two games. Right. If they Correct. win tonight, they'll play again. They'll play again. Right. Well, go Bobcats. We're, <laughs> We're waiting. Okay, right. until we hear the news, um, I superintendent's report. Beautiful evening, celebrating our cum laude so, inductees. So. There were 18 seniors who were inducted into the cum laude society. I want everybody to pay attention to the students, but um, Catherine Eshu gave one of the best speeches I have ever heard. It was fantastic. She talked about how this generation is sort of mislabeled, right? They're not lazy. They're not. And in doing so, she called out each student individually and what their accomplishments have been <laughs> that counter the generation, you know, the Gen Z um, terrible stereotypes of kids in that age. I mean, it, it was beautiful. I mean, just personalized for each child. Um, so thank you, Catherine, for celebrating those students so beautifully and knowing them so individually that she could speak to them. Uh, next, we had Cabaret 2023. What a fantastic night. I brought my 22-year-old son with me. <laughs> he thought it was pretty great. Um, they had the theme of color spanning all of these different decades and the participation of the group and the way they talked about this moment and how they've been waiting for this moment since they were freshmen really talks a lot about the group and how far they've come together. Um, and they gave a lot of credit to Doug Coates for helping them through this year and bringing them to this point. Um, it was a really a beautiful cabaret. Celebrating Italian Heritage Awards ceremony, ceremony recognizing excellence. This is the Westchester Coalition of Italian American Organizations. Um, and this is, I, you know, I'm not gonna say that right. Came together to celebrate Italian Heritage Month. Societa Honoraria Italica, the Honor Society. This special event was hosted um, for exceptional students and teachers who were promoting Italian language. And the theme for this year was the joys of learning Italian. Um, dedicated teachers nominated standout students. We had um, a bunch of our students from Byron Hills recognized and one who received a $500 scholarship toward Italian studies. Um, thank you to the teachers of Italian who were also honored for their outstanding contributions. Luisa Graniero, Melissa Zaccarina, and Jenna Ayazetti. And this is a lot of fun. Jen Fuenzalita is a Spanish teacher at the high school, and she designed this PBL task for her Spanish three students. Um, I think this brings a lot of school pride into her classroom. Um, they had to create a video or a flyer submission showcasing really what were the aspects of being in Byram Hills that you thought were strong. So students put together um, some, like on the right, you'll see what their classes were and when they met. And um, the different things that they were proud of in their schools. They had special questions that were involved, um, the days of the week that they were doing different things, and then what they liked about those specific classes in that school. Um, this is kind of a really fun one right here. Oh. 
En clase de español es muy interesante y útil. En la clase nosotros aprendemos vocabulario. También pedimos ayuda cuando estamos confundidas. Mi suena es muy cómica, simpática y muy organizada. En clase de biología, nosotros hacemos experimentos y están divertidos. Al año pasado, nuestra favorita es Miss Vaniquez porque es compasiva y amable. Todos los días estamos enfrasados en el trabajo que ella hace y sacamos buenas notas. En el diseño gráfico, nosotros somos creativas e inspiradas. En el clase hay muchas computadoras y hacer orden. En Barn Hills, nuestros amigos es escuela espírita. También tenemos partidos de fútbol todas las semanas y partidos de fútbol americano en la cancha. En el pasillo hay murales con hermosas pinturas por toda la escuela. La escuela empieza a las 8 y 10 y termina a las 2 y 22. Las clases son 64 minutos por periodo. En conclusión, Barn Hills es una ex excelente escuela que prepara a los estudiantes para la vida adulta. How great is that? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing that with us, Jen. Um, we have some athletic updates. Wait. We won! Yay! 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 Congratulations so to our girls, varsity, yeah. volleyball perfect team, timing. Yeah. perfect timing. Um, yes, here they were this past weekend, um, and Coach Jared Christensen, I'm sorry, Christian, phenomenal. Um, they swept John Jay Cross River 3-0 to zero to take Class A sectional championship, and now, as we know, they have gone to the first part of the Class A state regionals at Wallkill, and they defeated Wallkill. Congratulations, Bob. Yay, this is such good news. And um, Gina and I have been going to all of these volleyball matches. Matches? Games? Um, matches. Matches. matches? I call them matches. Um, we've been going to all of them and cheering on our Bobcats, and we're sorry we couldn't be with you tonight, but obviously we were busy too. But, we, um, we, get, we lent our president. Yes, our president is there. That is true. Congratulations, and we can't wait to see what you do next. And also, uh, we have regional champions, our um, boys varsity soccer team. They are in the spot in the state final four. They're going to play their next game in Middletown on Friday at 3.15. Gina Cunningham and I will be in attendance. And if they win, they play on Saturday. Correct? Correct. Yes. yes. So we are Back looking forward to that as well. What great seasons for these two teams, um, really putting their heart and soul into all of it. And we appreciate the opportunity to watch you. It's been fantastic. Go Bobcats. Go Bobcats. Go Bobcats. I think that's mm -hmm. it. Go Bobcats. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. yes. We're gonna have a parade. We're gonna have to, we have we need bigger. Well, let's not jump. Let's not jump what? ahead. But a parade would be really bad. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, I'm so happy. Okay. One more report tonight um, on literacy. So I want to talk about our literacy goals. Um, as a reminder, last year we conducted a literacy study. We brought in two expert researchers to guide us. Um, a group of administrators, teachers, and parents through the developmental stages of how students learn to read. And it was insightful, and we took a lot of that information away. What I did with that information is I condensed it into um, some slides, what we call takeaways, and I visited all of the grade levels from kindergarten through sixth grade and had discussions around those takeaways, and then elicited from those teachers, the classroom teachers, what are you grappling with now in the classroom, and how can we help formulate some goals in literacy over the next five years? So then, this over the summer, I worked with Ms. Peggy McInerney, our Common Hill principal, Mr. Dave Mack, our Wampus principal, um, and working with Ms. Meredith Bryant, our Assistant Director of Special Services, K-5. And we formulated um, uh, this document that I'll present tonight. And we also went around and got feedback again from our classroom teachers. So making sure that our teachers are part of this process 
as we go through to look at literacy. So on our first page, I give an overview of our philosophy around uh, literacy and show what is called the Scarsborough Road, which comes uh, from some research in 2001, um, looking at what we call the simple view of reading. It's really looking at two parts of reading, which is our word recognition and language comprehension and the elements behind each of those. So each of these skills here lead and are intertwined to become a skilled and fluent reader. And that is the goal of literacy. So it takes time. Um, the big takeaway of literacy is that our brains are not predetermined to read. We actually have to teach our brains how to read explicitly and complete a circuit of about four or five different regions of the brain and connect those regions in order for us to read proficiency. Unlike oral language, which we can pick up, in facial recognition or recognition of objects. Think of a young baby. They can recognize your face. They can recognize your pet, but they can't recognize the alphabet and what those sounds are. So we have to connect speech to each element of sound, break it down into its phonemes, and then we have to make that connection to print and then make meaning of those words. So it's a whole process and mapping of the brain that occurs. The science is really fascinating behind it, but within that, we then learn the strategies in the classroom that then make us skilled and fluent readers. So I'm going to go through some goals. I won't go into details. It's about a 10-page document of goals. This will be a living document. So every year, we'll revise this document. I'll present it again to you, and it'll guide us over the next few years as we hone in on really refining um, our literacy curriculum. So the way we organize this, I'm going to start with K-5 goals, and then we have some building goals and grade level goals. So a few big areas, and I've talked about these at previous meetings, so you might have heard some of the conversation. Right now we're conducting an assessment audit. We're looking at all of the assessments that we give K-5, and then we're going to make sure that these are the right assessments. We're going to see if there's redundancies in those assessments or if there's any gaps. So for example, iReady is one of our assessments that we use right now as a diagnostic and progress monitoring tool. Are we doing other assessments that might overlap with that? Or are there other things that are missing that we might need to go deeper with? So that's what we're in the process of collecting right now. In December, we're bringing all that data together and we'll start analyzing it. And we have an expert consultant guiding us through that process as well. We're going to be looking at our multi-tiered system of supports, MTSS plan, which is that process of how we look at data and look at each kid to see if they're reaching proficiency in grade level standards, and if not, providing interventions and monitoring the progress to make sure they get up to proficiency uh, before we exit them from the intervention. So that's what we're revising at all grade levels K-12. We're doing that everywhere. And then special education we've talked about. We are um, we uh, did training in Orton-Gillingham last year of every single special education teacher, K-5, and some middle school special education teachers. This year I have 10 teachers who are doing the next level of Orton-Gillingham training. So that first level is a is uh, the first semester of a graduate level course. And now the teachers are doing that second and third level this year. It's a really intensive process where they work with an outside mentor who comes in and videotapes 10 lessons throughout the years and analyzes those lessons. And teachers at the end of this process will receive um, certification that they're certified Orton-Gillingham teachers. It's a really rigorous process. Um, but it's how, I think it's having a big impact on our kids and on our special um, on our curriculum for special services for special education kids. I'm really impressed with our teachers who are making this commitment. Yeah, it's a big commitment, and I yeah. thank them for it. Um, and they take it really seriously. Our teachers don't do these types of things lightly, so it's really it's amazing. It's amazing. We also, as a K-5, um, are looking at a goal of communicating literacy, our literacy curriculum to our family. So I'm in the process of taking our curriculum documents and the programs we use and putting them into um, a format where we can present it online that's readable for our families so that uh, we have a lot of information that our secondary curriculum online, but we don't have a lot K-5. So that's a goal of ours this year and going forward to the next few years. So I'm hoping by the end of this year, we'll have some of our curriculum on our district website. That's great. At Coleman Hill specifically, again, Parent Partnerships is the title. That's going along with communication. We hope to have some principal's coffees. So in some evening presentations where we can start bringing our parents in and continuing the dialogue around literacy and um, having conversations about how we're instructing kids in literacy, what are the best practices, and then how can parents help their kids at home. So we're going to be doing that at both Coleman Hill and Wampus. 
We're committed to using research-based instructional practices, and we're currently, for example, at Coleman Hill, all the teachers are reading a book called Shifting the Balance, which is a book on shifting your practice away from balanced literacy to more research, aligning it more with research-based practices. We're all engaged in that conversation now at Coleman Hill. Next year, we're going to be reading the next level book. There's a three through five book, just came out this year, last month, and we'll be reading that book with Wampus eventually. And reviewing our foundations implementation. Foundations is our phonics program. And that program, we train every new teacher into the district, gets trained on foundations. And we've, had, we've been training existing teachers, our veteran teachers have been training in that over the past couple of years. And we've been tightening up our, our curriculum in foundations, which is our phonics program. That's implemented from kindergarten through third grade. And phonological and phonemic awareness is another oral language development that's really important in that connection to connecting how students speak to the printed text. And we are in the process with our kindergarten teachers of reviewing a program and piloting. So we're training in December, and we will probably start a pilot in January on that program. We're looking at our academic support. We thank the board for adding a support teacher to kindergarten, we know from the research that early intervention is critical, that we should have all students have, being able to read and being able to decode, in other words, cracking the code of literacy by the end of first grade. 95% of students should be able to crack the code by the end of first grade according to the research. So we're committed to making sure our students can do that. And we're putting that extra resources into our kindergarten uh, program in order to do that for students. We're looking at our current curriculum wonders. We'll be evaluating that over the next few years to see if that is the right curriculum for us once we unpack more of the, um, the research-based strategies and start to analyze what we're doing in our curriculum now. We'll see if wonders is the right program for us. The overall consensus when I'm starting to read research reports on it and talk to experts who work with Funday or with wonders is that it's a bit of a... Um, uh, one, one person told me they thought it was bloated. <laughs> There's a lot mm -hmm. of stuff in it, and that's why I've been hearing that from the teachers. Yeah. Where do we make decisions? What can we take out of it? It's just, the teacher said it's, you would need all day to do like, Every aspect one. of it. Yeah. So it's too much, and some researchers are looking at that, and they just say there's too many tasks in a particular lesson for kids. That is cognitive overload for kids mm -hmm. at that age, particularly in that early elementary, in the primary elementary grades in particular. Um, we're looking at small group differentiated instruction. How do we make sure we're honing in on kids' skill levels that they need um, in small groups? We're analyzing um, our text and having access to our text um, at all different levels so that we can make sure kids have high quality text in the classroom, which they do, but we're looking through that process to make sure um, just a, a reassessment of our library based on what we're learning from the research. Looking at fluency, how are we assessing fluency? Um, we've, our literacy study highlighted the different aspects of fluency, so we're looking more carefully, and that'll be part of our assessment audit, how do we assess fluency, and then how do we instruct in fluency? What's the expectation at different grade levels? As we go into Wampus, again, doing parent partnerships, looking at research-based instructional strategies, and also looking at our writing curriculum. Um, we don't want to forget writing is a strong companion to reading, and so we're starting to um, analyze our writing curriculum as well. Again, we're reviewing the Wonders curriculum in third grade. We're studying read-alouds in fourth grade, which is an instructional strategy to help with reading comprehension and vocabulary um, and background knowledge. That's an, an aspect of read-alouds that is powerful. And we're also analyzing the word study curriculum post phonics in third grade. So what do we do with the word study and vocabulary, comprehension, background knowledge? Um, in fourth and fifth grade and pulling in on that particular curriculum as well, making sure it's aligned to the, the research. And finally, um, content-rich curriculum. There's a lot of research that background knowledge and vocabulary correlate strongly to students' ability to read. In that. Mm -hmm. um, and as you get into the upper grades, what's harder in the upper grades about reading instruction and literacy curriculum is that there's no end to how to learn and what to learn. Unlike phonics, it's concrete and it's there's an end to it. Now, it's what we call constrained skills. You learn it, and once you learn it, you're done with it. Same thing with phonological awareness. When you get to vocabulary, even as adults, we can always continue to learn vocabulary. We can continue to learn uh, comprehension strategies and how to understand um, a complex text. So as you get into the upper elementaries, 
the literacy curriculum gets more complicated because those skills are what we call unconstrained. There's no limit to vocabulary instruction. They're not done with it ever. So in addition to teaching vocabulary, we need to teach skills of how to continually learn vocabulary. So there's a lot we're unpacking at the upper elementary that's different than the primary grades, which is interesting. And then we keep what I call a parking lot. Here's the things that we're putting on the list to start studying next year or in future years. So we have a bunch of things on there um, as well. So this will be a living, breathing document that will guide our literacy work over the next few years. Um, and probably for a long time because that was a lot of work to do. <laughs> and it's a lot to do in, as you're doing it. Um, hopefully in the summer we can get more work done. But um, it's going to be ongoing conversations with our elementary teachers and work. And they're working really hard. And teachers are we're having some good conversations and exploring really important aspects of our curriculum for kids. And our teachers are so caring about it and take this really seriously. So the conversations are good and thorough, and um, we're making really great progress pretty quickly. So I wanted to present that. I'll put this on our website so the community can take a closer look. And I always encourage our community to reach out if they have any questions. The depth of detail in this report, Tim, is unbelievable. I know. Sure. Unparalleled. I, 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 really I mean, words, so. I, <laughs> there's a lot to it. it there's a lot, but I it's really incredible. You the focus, you the everything. process, and then the intended outcomes, because it just helps me be concrete, because it's so yeah. much that I need a little checklist. You hit every to corner. all the time and yeah. Yeah. make sure we're making progress in all these areas. And they're working on that checklist. They are. And so a day doesn't go by, I don't speak with either teachers or with Peggy or Dave or Meredith about some aspect of this work. So we're, everyone's attention is on this, and we're putting a lot of our resources and our energy um, and good thinking to it. So Thank we're going to do amazing work. It's incredibly thorough. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for all your support. Um, we really appreciate it. Tim, incredible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I would say more about you, but I've said so much. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. What she said before. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah. That's it for staff. We're in such right? a good place because of it. Yeah. Are there any board reports tonight? I went to the um, PTSA meeting today, so just I can quickly say, as always, there's a lot going on with them. Um, tons of fundraising and community building events, uh, activities. There's an upcoming Trolls movie event that they're running. Um, that sounds great. Um, over across the schools, they are organizing and running multiple food and clothing drives in the coming months at the various schools to benefit local charities, Blythedale Hospital, Hillside Food Outreach. Um, and as always, it's a very committed group of parents who are putting in a lot of time and effort to make sure that, you know, all of our kids have, are benefiting from all the activities and, and events that they're planning. So we appreciate them. Thanks, Melissa. I went to the NISBA um, board meeting um, and it was long, and... <laughs> like, that's the understatement of the day. Yeah. It was very long. What time did it end? You all all know. No, I would like to know, what time did it start? It started at 4, and, and it ended I think at... it ended maybe at 11.56 p.m. Oh. Straight. <clears throat> and I was on the entire time. That's a lot of hours on Zoom. Wow. Yeah. So, but they got everything done. They got their were elected, they um, passed a lot of resolutions. They did send out a report, so if you want to know the resolutions that were passed, what were was not passed, I can forward it to you, but I think it was forwarded to everyone in the um, packet. Um, and I volunteer anyone else to do it next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, it was a good learning experience, so I'm glad I went. Thank you, Lori. I went to um, the Education Foundation meeting, which I think was happened in between the last two meetings yes. that we had, and um, it was a great meeting. We spoke mostly about plans for learning commons and for the field and for the lights and how the BHEF could potentially play a really important role in that, and there was a lot of enthusiasm, excitement, and an incredible amount of just organization and dedication, so very good conversation. Obviously, it will depend on the vote. Um, <coughs> In, um, in the spring for the overall project, but I think there's a lot of commitment there to really try to be helpful, so it was great. And then we went to, Tim, um, Jen and I went to an event last night that was a regional event for board members and superintendents where we learned a lot about performance assessments 
And I think one of my big takeaways is, even though um, you know, the presentation was something new for the region, we some of our initiatives in our high school for many, many years has really taken lots of elements of this, whether it's science research startup or Google scholars. <coughs> You're having um, different types of assessments, not your classic, you know, test that would be multiple choice and lots of interaction with adults and and um, just a project-based learning uh, that students are really passionate about, uh, where they can go into depth on a topic. So a lot of the themes they talked about are actually things that you know we have touched on. So it was it was, it was good though, good to get everybody together. Yeah, I leaned over to Jen and said, we were starting this work about 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But, it's but it has work. to be carefully done. It does. And yeah, it's difficult for it to be all that yeah. and yeah. not the rest, it's difficult. right? It yeah. is difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are schools where they, that's the entire approach. Like, soup to nuts, every subject, it's very mm -hmm. different. Interesting. And I went to the sport liaison meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Jen was there. And we discussed the lights um, learning in action. And you'd be surprised the kids were the most excited about the learning comments. Yes. They lit up. They were they were happy about that. That's where you life. heard, whoa! And they're like, oh my goodness, what a great place to have lunch and to learn. And they really were very on board with it. So You showed the slideshow. Mm -hmm. The sport liaison. Yes, and to the community, we will have a video going out tomorrow so that everyone in the school community can get a real sense of the projects that we're proposing. Excellent. Any communications to the board? Yes. There was a communication to the board um, from parents. Can I just say it since Mia's not here? I think so. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, from um, one family in the community who reached out to the board um, in response to a letter that the board sent out. And I've had communications with that family, and they were incredibly helpful in framing our thinking. So I will be back in touch with them. Thank you. And they were heard. Mm. Okay, uh, can I please have a motion to approve the minutes from the October 10th, 2023 board meeting? I know you're going to abstain, right? So, so moved. moved. Okay. Second. All in <laughs> favor? We have a quorum. Uh, and can I have a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Good evening. Good, evening. Good luck Barrow with the elections. Go Bobcats! Go Bobcats! Yay! Yay!